Hi and welcome to OCRA A-Level Biology Revision with me, Christine. So I'm going to look at module three today, specifically transport in plants and translocation. So before I can talk about that, I want to take you back to module two and talk about photosynthetic tissue and the fact that it produces monosaccharides such as glucose. Now you need to know the differentiation of the cell, specifically the palisade cell, which makes up the mesophyll, which is the tissue within the plant leaf. So some of the key features you'll need to be able to describe are things like, we expect there to be lots of chloroplasts. Why? Because this is the part of the leaf where photosynthesis occurs the most. These cells are long, they are closely packed together so they can maximise that absorption of light. They have very thin walls, increasing the diffusion rate of the carbon dioxide that we want for photosynthesis. And they have a large vacuole and that ensures that these cells maintain their turgor pressure. Now, we know that photosynthesis occurs and that therefore re results in the glucose being the monomer that is made. Now, you need to be able to identify which monomer and the key part here is if I look at carbon one, I can see that the hydrogen is above, therefore that tells me that it's an alpha glucose. Now, when photosynthesis occurs, it's going to make glucose for respiration that's fantastic as an metabolically active molecule, but if we want to transport this molecule somewhere else within the plant, we need to convert it. So the plant actually converts the glucose into sucrose, which is a disaccharide. Now that sucrose, which is a disaccharide, is made up of glucose and fructose, and it's joined together by a glycosidic bond through a condensation reaction. Now you don't need to know that it's a one to two glycosidic bond, but they may ask you to identify the type of glycosidic bond that is present in a diagram. So the key thing to note is it's an alpha glucose because I can see at carbon one, the hydrogen is above, but with fructose, we've actually got a beta fructose molecule and we're using the second carbon to form that glycosidic bond. So that might help you out with a bit of chemistry there, but with regards to biology, you need to be able to say that it's a glycosidic bond. And if they're going to give it to you in a question, it will be looking at you understanding that it's an alpha glucose that makes up the sucrose with fructose. Now, what we want to look at is how is this sucrose actually converted? So translocation is the movement which is loading, mass flow and unloading of assimilates. And the assimilates you need to know are things like sugar, in this case sucrose, and also other assimilates could be amino acids. But in the exam, they're probably going to be asking you specifically just to describe sucrose. Now the movement of this sucrose in the phloem is an active process and we're going to look at how that happens but the first thing to note is that it goes from the source, the photosynthetic tissue, i.e. leaves and stems, all the way to the sink. Now the sink can be roots and it can be meristem. So how does it get from that source, transported through the process of mass flow and then unloaded at the sinks. So to load the phloem, the first thing that we need to know is there's actually two pathways. So the first pathway I'm going to talk about is the cytoplasm, and that is the symplast pathway. So when the sucrose is produced through the condensation reaction, it can then diffuse as a passive process all the way through the cytoplasm through the different cells by being connected by these plasmodesmata. So that basically means that it's the symplast pathway, a passive process, because it is continually through the cytoplasm from one cell to the next until it is loaded into the phloem sieve tube elements. So that's the symplast pathway, which is a passive process. Although that does occur, not a lot of the movement of sucrose happens through the symplast pathway. The majority of the pathway 
of sucrose is actually through the apoplast pathway. Now the apoplast pathway is through the cell wall and intercellular space. Now to understand this, I need to take you back to module two again and discuss what's happening with regards to the plasma membrane. So we know that the plasma membrane is a hydrophobic phospholipid bilayer, which therefore means that any polar molecule or any large molecules are prevented from crossing the plasma membrane unless there is very specific proteins in place. So at the source, the plasma membrane actually contains transporters for sucrose. So these are proteins that are very specific to allow sucrose to cross the membrane. That therefore allows for the sucrose to move out of the cytoplasm and into the cell wall and the intercellular spaces. And what will then happen is through the apoplast pathway, that sucrose will make its way all the way down to the companion cell. So we need to talk about how it gets back across the plasma membrane into that companion cell. And that's done by the process of actively transporting hydrogen ions out of the companion cell into the cell wall or into the intercellular space. Now, the reason they pump the hydrogen ions, now we're pumping its active transport, is to create a concentration gradient in this cell wall and intercellular space. So because it's active transport, we require ATP. That ATP needs to be hydrolyzed down into ADP. And that energy that is released through that hydrolysis, hydrolysis reaction is enough to pump those hydrogens against their concentration gradient. So therefore, they're going from a low concentration in the cytoplasm to a higher concentration outside. And what that then means is that those hydrogen ions are going to then diffuse down their concentration gradient. And when they diffuse down the concentration gradient, they go through a co-transporter. And what that will then do is that will then move the sucrose back into the cytoplasm of the companion cell along with the hydrogen ions. So what we've done is we've now crossed the barrier of the phospholipid bilayer by using the co-transporter, which brings the hydrogen ions and the sucrose in together through facilitated diffusion. But now what we need to do is we need to get that sucrose into the phloem and that happens through the plasma desmatis again, so therefore back to the symplast pathway. So we have loaded in both using the apoplast pathway and the symplast pathway. So what we now need to know is if we are looking at our water that is moving up through the xylem vessel, we know that we're going to load the sucrose into the phloem at the place where the source is. And the source is the photosynthetic pigment. And the source is the photosynthetic tissue. It's then moved into the phloem. And what's then going to happen is that loading of the sucrose into the phloem is going to result in a lowering of the water potential inside the phloem at that point. Well, that therefore is going to mean that water will move into the phloem from surrounding cells and the xylem by osmosis. Remember, water will move from a high water potential to a lower water potential. So if we've lowered the water potential inside the phloem sieve tube element, water will then move by osmosis into that area. Now, we know that water is incompressible. We know that there is a rigidity and this is going to result in a buildup of hydrostatic pressure. That buildup of hydrostatic pressure is therefore going to push the water and the water will flow from this area of a high hydrostatic pressure to an area which has a lower hydrostatic pressure. And that can be bidirectional. It can go down and up within the phloem. 
So if we're going down and we're going to the sink then, what we need to do is we need to unload the sucrose. So to do that, what we have is this diffusion of sucrose from the phloem to the surrounding cells through that plasma desmata. So the sucrose is then going to be converted either back to glucose so it can be used in respiration or it could be converted into starch as a storage molecule or it could be converted into amino acids and uh, therefore allowing for growth of the tissue. So when we unload that removal of the sucrose, the unloading of the sucrose out of the phloem, that loss is going to therefore increase the water potential of the phloem and that's therefore going to result in water now leaving the phloem to the surrounding cells, to the xylem and that is therefore going to lower that hydrostatic pressure. So we have now unloaded the sucrose. So the loading of the sucrose happens at the source, the unloading at the sink. And as I said before, it can be bi-directional in the phloem. The sink can also be above the source and therefore the sink could be, for example, fruits and seeds growing leaves that are above. Now it's important to note that if we are storing the glucose in these locations, the sinks, so we've taken the sucrose and we've now converted that into the glucose and now stored it as starch, what that means is that the source can could actually be a storage organ, i.e. it can be a seed or it could be a taproot and tuber. So in the winter months, when the leaves have been dropped and the plant is no longer photosynthesizing as much as it was before, what the source becomes, the source is there for that storage organ. When a seed falls into the ground, that seed contains a storage organ, that storage organ is now the source. So it's important to note that translocation is always from the source to the sink, but it depends in the example what they are giving you as to what that source or that sink may be. And that's based on what the plant needs. So I hope you've liked my video and if you um, do like the video, then please do click on the like button and please do subscribe to my channels to check out more videos for OCRA A-Level Biology.